I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Um, I'm thrilled to have with us uh, the Honorable Phil Sharp. Phil has, been a distinct, has a distinguished record across energy and environmental research and policy. During his 20 years um, in the congressional tenure as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from the great state of Indiana, Phil played key leadership roles in the development of landmark energy legislation, including the Energy Policy Act of 1992 and the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. These two acts are known as some of the most effective and significant pieces of energy and environmental legislation in modern history. After leaving Congress, Phil was a member of the National Research Council's Committee on the Effectiveness and Impact of Corporate Average Fuel Economy or CAFE Standards, and he chaired the Secretary of Energy's Electric System Reliability Task Force. In 2015, Phil was awarded the second ever James R. Schlesinger Medal for Energy Security by Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz for his role in facilitating natural gas deregulation and establishing fuel economy standards. On a personal note, um, I met Phil about six, seven years ago when he was president of Resources for the Future. And so this is the oldest uh, DC think tank in this space. I was a fellow of New World Capital Group. This is a private equity firm in New York City and was introduced to Phil by a mutual friend, Carter Bales, who's also a fellow alumnus of Princeton University. And I remember fondly uh, those round tables about carbon policy, Phil, um, and how passionately uh, you were rallying for support from the business sector. So it's really this kind of foresight and big picture thinking uh, that are critical to meeting the energy and decarbonization goals of today and tomorrow. We're absolutely delighted to have you here with us uh, to share your insights and reflections on the past, current, and future energy landscape. And after Phil's remarks, uh, he will be joined by Judy Greenwall, who worked with Phil for seven years, as I understand it. Uh, she was one of our inaugural Gary Andlinger Visiting Fellow, and uh, is now a non-resident fellow at the Andlinger Center for question and answers. So without further ado, Phil, the stage is yours. Lynn, thank you so much for those very generous remarks. And if I deserved half of them, I would have you smart enough to sit down <laughs> and not uh, open this up to exposure. Uh, but I, I do want to thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here on the campus and at the Anglier Center. Uh, but I have to say, frankly, that as a former member of Congress, I'm happy to be invited just about anywhere. <laughs> but let me say it is an honor to be here at Princeton, where so much important work has been done for uh, more than a decade uh, on the uh, climate issues, whether it's in policy or science or engineering uh, uh, fields. And in particular, I had the pleasure of working with Rob Sokolow and actually working with him meant I got an education uh, on uh, the uh, uh, America's Climate Choices, a five-volume study that the, Amer the Academy of Sciences uh, put together. And of course, he and Steve uh, Pakala had uh, uh, dramatically increased uh, people's understanding and education on this with their wedges theory more than a decade ago. I can't even remember now. I'm <clears throat> reaching an age where you'll forgive me if uh, things fade in the memory. <clears throat> something to be taken into account in this presidential election, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but let me, let me suggest what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a quick 50,000-foot flyover of the last three years' development sort of in federal policy and, po and, and politics uh, uh, and the debate uh, about climate. Uh, and then I'm going to close uh, briefly with an assertion that uh, we really need something akin to a climate moonshot in terms of national focus and global focus uh, on this issue issue, uh, and we need to advance what I call and what others call climate citizenship. But let me start, since I'm from D.C., with a fantasy. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and this has to do with what if President Trump, when he swore into office, decided to become a leader on climate policy in this country? Several prominent, very prominent uh, uh, conservative leaders uh, like George Shultz, uh, like um, James Baker, came to the White House and urged them to adopt a carbon neutral, I mean, a, a revenue neutral carbon tax as a basic policy. 
also suggesting that it could also be an alternative to an extensive regulatory set of policies that had been put in place uh, under the Obama administration. Well, of course, as we all need, uh, and, and let me suggest that um, most economists suggest that kind of policy, at least the, uh, the, uh, the carbon tax pricing policy is an important technique to mobilize, mobilize our incredibly complex uh, economy to get consumption and investment decisions shifted and stimulated toward more innovation and to uh, uh, different activities. Well, and by the way, President Obama advocated using a pricing policy too, but when that failed in the Congress, uh, he resorted to using uh, established laws to try to regulate a whole host of uh, uh, aspects of the economy. Well, as we all know, instead, President Trump decided to spread ignorance about science, about the Paris, the requirements of the Paris Agreement, about the costs of action, about the costs of inaction, uh, and inaction, and um, is basically try to sideline uh, most of the scientists in the country that are on this kind of an issue. And in a policy, uh, I don't even need to reiterate for this office, a variety of things pulling out of Paris, which was just triggered finally, uh, rollbacks in all kinds of major regulatory systems, uh, reduce the calculation that is made on the social cost of benefits, because that feeds throughout the whole regulatory processes of the federal government, and to try to cut science fund funding. Well, given our Separation of powers, which for most Americans is a very frustrating system of government, where power is allocated among the three branches of government, it actually wasn't so easy uh, for the administration to make most of these decisions. And indeed, uh, what's probably not known by a lot of Americans is the bipartisan effort, for example, to push back on the appropriations and make sure that not only did we fund ARPA-E, which is the innovative um, aspect of the research organization, which, by the way, is, it works closely with the private sector, uh, to fund that, but actually to increase that expenditure. It was supposed to be wiped out according to the uh, president's budget, a uh, kind of thing. And the, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, an independent commission, refused to adopt a, a policy to drive, to drive up uh, support for existing uh, coal plants. And even the federal utility, which the president appoints some of the board of directors uh, to, uh, took a major vote earlier this year in which they said, no, we're not we're going to go ahead with our plans to close down and phase out a number of um, uh, coal plants in the TVA system. And of course, most of the regulatory activities are still pending in federal courts uh, around the country. Uh, this isn't a easy way to make decisions in this world. It never has been, but it, it has had that impact in this case. And of course, much of these activities could be restored by the next president without having control of a Congress that was ready uh, to work with them. And why is that the case? It's the case because one of uh, what might be viewed from some perspectives as a failure of the Republican-controlled Congress and President was they could have changed the underlying laws, like the Clean Air Act, that authorized the ability to regulate. They could have changed the broader thing, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, which sets the kind of rules and regulatory analysis that's required uh, throughout the regulatory systems of the federal government. They could have even decided that in certain cases, they would just try to preempt the authority of state governments uh, to act because they were interfering with interstate commerce. But none of this uh, was, in fact, uh, done. And there are a number of uh, folks uh, on that side of the political fence that are very disappointed that it wasn't. But beyond what the federal government was doing or not doing over the last three years, of course, and I only want to spend a moment on what is really significant activity, but is we've had enormous a number of activities by state and local governments on a policy drives to try to change uh, the, uh, what's happening in the country, by corporate citizens from the, from the uh, ExxonMobil, among others, and, and a host of oil companies uh, all across the board to cut their carbon footprint to take real actions and make long-term uh, commitments. We've seen all kinds of uh, vibrant organizations take policies to cut their carbon footprints. And of course, here at the university, uh, you folks have gone through a process of creating a sustainability plan, which as I understand, has significantly upped the ambition of the university uh, so that by 2046, you'll be in the net zero carbon. The goal is to be in net zero carbon, and I guess that's the 300th anniversary of the university. Uh, nice pairing there. Um, but uh, also, uh, <clears throat> 
and that's happening in virtually every university uh, in the country. Uh, and those activities would be worth a lot of attention because in my view, that's one of the assets of American society, our civil society, our economy, is that you can get all of this independent action without the federal government trying to direct and control it uh, kind of proposition. Well, let's turn to what has actually happened on federal climate uh, politics since the last election, the 2018 uh, election. And as most of you know, there has emerged on the de Democratic or liberal side of the fence the, the so-called Green New Deal, not so-called, it is called the Green New Deal uh, uh, proposition, and which uh, by now, almost everybody that's been following this understands it's not really a set of policies. It is a set of goals and ambitions. Um, uh, it's a political manifesto of where they would like society to be uh, in a fair, in very much in a hurry. And the leaders of it will tell you they're designed not to try to fill in the policies, but rather to create a movement that will help uh, generate activity. Now, these are big goals. As I've said, there are very few policy prescriptions. The one that's most obvious is 100% clean energy and the clean electricity by 2030 uh, uh, kind of proposition. And there was never really any analysis provided behind what it would take uh, for this to happen um, kind of thing. And as you know, it's had a big political impact because it really brought the spotlight back onto uh, the, uh, the issue. And it's made several dramatic claims that have been added to the debate. The most important being a real sense of urgency that we should be acting. The second being that we really need to be concerned about equity, what happens to all kinds of people and, and geographic areas in the country. And the third, a claim um, that we really can do something major about the climate and have economic growth. Now, people might differ over whether they've got the perspective on that, but a lot of analysis now is showing that if you choose wisely on your policies, you can manage to have prosperity and do something about the climate. And by the way, if we don't negotiate those goals, we're probably never going to, uh, to get there. But let me suggest uh, there may be those of you in the office that are fired up by this and everything is, let's just be careful that we don't let trying to have everything mean that we cannot support something. In other words, do not let the perfect become the enemy of the good, because in politics, you've got to get what you can get. Uh, well, let me turn now on the other side of the political fence, because there really have been some very important uh, developments on the Republican, in, in the Congress, from uh, Republican members of Congress. Uh, and, and it kind of was wrapped up in a package of what I think is what is developing, is what I would call a technological innovation strategy. And that is to say, look, we need to invest more federal dollars and private dollars in long-term uh, possible solutions. Uh, and uh, Senator uh, Barrasso from uh, Wyoming, who's chairman of the, uh, in, uh, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate, and he's from uh, uh, Wyoming, uh, where they produce a lot of natural gas, a lot of oil and, uh, and uh, fossil fuels. Um, he, one, did uh, what seems to be uh, for some reason surprising, acknowledging that humans were a major cause uh, of this proposition. Uh, two, and then he was advocating the uh, technological innovation, and he basically saw it as an alternative to having a lot of regulation or any kind of a, a tax policy. And of course, the practical problem certainly is, is, from my point of view and others, is it seems to lack a sense of urgency, but uh, it does it does mean, very importantly, one prong of the strategy that the country needs is, in fact, as the, this Climate Choices uh, panel that I talked about with Rob Sokolow was on, said, you've got to be working ahead to some long-term options. You don't know what will develop, but you can't be sure we've got all the knowledge now that will uh, get us there. And of course, he actually mentions uh, carbon uh, capture and, and use uh, and advanced uh, nuclear technology and fusion kind of proposition. Well, this is certainly a welcome change from, you know, the senator from Oklahoma who tried to show us it really isn't warming. He can take a snowball onto the floor of the, uh, the U.S. Senate where there's a, I'm surprised it wouldn't melt there with all the hot air, but you know. Uh, and, and the former chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, who one time in the debate about this, he was 
being smart alecky, uh, which many people on both sides get, uh, and he said, well, what do the activists want? They want to have us stop exhaling all the carbon dioxide that we put in the air. Well, you know, not a bad strategy for a few of those folks. Uh, and, and a very important other development by Senator Brasco was Senator uh, uh, Alexander from uh, uh, the state of Tennessee, who's chairman of the, the appropriation, Relevance Appropriations Subcommittee, and he said he really wanted to double the funding of, for research and development uh, on clean energy, and by that he meant from uh, solar wind improvements to uh, uh, nuclear and uh, CCUS. Um, so uh, this is an important development, uh, like uh, the one thing we always have to watch out for, in my view, is things becoming a political excuse for not doing anything else, and I hope that won't be on that side, just like I hope the, the desire to totally conquer every ill in America will not become a, a limitation on the left. Well, let me suggest to you that um, uh, neither of these strategies or the advocates so far have been willing to endorse a carbon tax of any variation or source over the long term. And I just think it's important to point out that the goals of both of them would be advanced by this. And there are multiple reasons for that, but let me tell you that is believed by many people to be one of the strongest signals we can send to the economy to get what you want uh, on those propositions. Now, that's not to say that this is a sufficient policy for climate, but in, in my view and many others, it ought to be a central policy, a pricing policy you, you can have cap and trade or you can have the carbon tax and you can design them in ways that look an awful lot alike. That's a lot of the research from uh, RFF, the, where I was the head of that. I, I was hired not to do the thinking at Resources for the Future. I was hired to clean out the tank. Um, <laughs> but let, let, let's, turn to the, the pres, let's turn to the presidential organization, the presidential campaigns, where a, a really remarkable thing has happened, and that is it has become, certainly on the Democratic side, a, a top priority, not just, well, I've got an answer here and an answer there, and they have been pummeled and had special events on television and in all kinds of places over this issue. We have never before seen this rise to that kind of priority and the kind of commitment uh, and, frankly, the kind of bidding <laughs> that is going on among them as to, I, I'm more committed than you're more committed uh, kind of thing, and uh, if you don't believe me, I'll spend more than you uh, kind of proposition <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and whatnot. And the value of this is it has... What a, lot, a lot of people misunderstand about campaigning. They think it's about educating the people. Well, hopefully you do some of that. What really gets educated are the candidates, the people that are around them, and what they're going to try to do when they're in office. Uh, it's a marvelous, it's a first-rate education for those of you who want to run for office um, kind of thing. But let me suggest to you that... Um, that it does have value in, in this educational effort that's going on, among other things. But I want to pull out, uh, and, and just because it raises another possible uh, strategy here, or at least another prong in the strategy, and, and that's a little bit about Bernie Sanders' uh, plan, because he takes a different approach than most of the other folks, not just in the campaign, but as we've had these, de we've had these debates for a long time over regulation or, or uh, or pricing or what mix of them. But uh, I just want to focus, he raises several questions here. Of course, as you, I think you know, and I hope I got it right, is uh, I looked at his website and it wasn't as always easy with most of these to follow. Uh, well, some of us aren't as skilled. But um, <laughs> he raises the issue of, I'm, I'd like to have the federal government, he says, spend $16 trillion over the next decade. And then he has a fairly elaborate allocation of uh, uh, how that would be spent. Now. If I, if my math's anywhere close, and this isn't my strong suit, uh, just very quickly on the back of the envelope kind of thing, this is like a 30% or 35% increase in what the federal government spends now on an annual basis. Uh, and so this is big deal. <laughs> it's not a small potatoes uh, kind of proposition. But the key here that I think is important is this begins to take the point of view that we can really raise the capital needed in this sector through taxation and federal expenditures. And certainly we're going to need to do more on federal expenditures in my view. But in our society, the question is, and one of the virtues of the incentives that are in the carbon tax and some of the other regulatory systems is, we need to get 
big, big investments over the next three decades by the private sector where most capital in America uh, is derived from, unless you're willing to really uh, transform our political system in a way that some would like, but I don't think that it's going to sell in this country uh, kind of thing. Another element of it is, um, <clears throat> again, it's a little hard to be clear on this, but uh, it's an effort to say, well, the federal government will basically own the new investments in uh, wind, solar, and, ge and geothermal, and in the electric sector, and, uh, and it will be fed in, much as it uh, had, has, does own and did build the, uh, the hydroelectric plants, the giant ones in this country, um, kind of proposition. And then we will also take over the transmission system of the federal government and run it. Well, some of you may want to do some student, a good piece of analysis would be to look at what historically has been the result. Uh, sometimes it's been positive, sometimes it's been negative, but of the government effort to try to control these aspects uh, kind of thing. And of course, he tried to put on a price ceiling on uh, electricity so that consumers would not feel any proposition uh, that might come about by either the government or the various other regulatory policies creating costs. Now, I've got to tell you, I supported oil price controls, I supported natural gas price controls, and I supported taking off those controls. I've managed to be on both sides of a lot of issues. Uh, <laughs> if you get reelected, you got the opportunity. <laughs> but, but I would just suggest to you, price controls fundamentally don't work over time if you're trying to make changes. Uh, and so I would just argue, take a close look. Uh, kind of thing. But there's a lot of analysis that could be done here. I raise this just because it's another strategy way of going, which I don't think it's the way we're going to go, but it contrasts with the others. Well, beyond the current campaign that is going on, there are some other broader shifts in sort of debate around strategy, debate around what policy ought to be, and especially affecting technological developments. And let me just tick off very quickly some of these. By the way, you're going to have a chance to challenge my assertions and, and uh, um, try to bring me down out of 50,000 feet, uh, if you can get me there. Um, but the first is that what we see uh, across the board, just like you did here at Princeton, is setting long-term goals uh, and trying to, uh, to set them. And this has certainly uh, value and utility uh, in doing that. Um, my one cautionary note on that is, again, don't let that become a political excuse for not engaging in the hard work <laughs> of how in the private sector or the public sector we begin to change people's behavior. That's what policy ought to be focused on. It isn't a matter, it's easy to go and vote <laughs> uh, wherever it is for, oh, I'm 50, 2050, yeah, that's where we ought to be. I won't be around, but, and, uh, and nobody will remember how I voted, but that, that, goes, that can be an easy political excuse and an out for people who, want act, who think they want action. So uh, that, I'm just I'm big on political excuses, as you might see, <clears throat> having mastered some of them. Um, but let me say the second thing is much, what's interesting, too, and I think very important, is increasingly those debates have shifted off of saying, well, we know what technology ought to be, and that's what the goal is, is to adopt these specific set of technologies, as opposed to the goal ought to be to cut emissions <laughs> and, what, and leaving open as much as possible the ways that in the private or public sector we find how to get there uh, kind of proposition, which, by the way, I think will enhance the adoption of innovation throughout the society. Uh, uh, again, these are always balanced uh, and emphasis uh, uh, questions. But for example, California just adopted their 2045 uh, 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 goal, of, uh, and they decided to make it 100% carbon free. Uh, instead of, as some of them we wanted to do, was just up the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, and make it, uh, you know, a basic uh, add storage to um, uh, renewables, and then you've got the package that will do it. And they even state that that may include nuclear, by the way, it's probably imported nuclear from outside the, the, uh, the state, hydroelectric and natural gas with CCS. So even in California, which has tended to be highly regulatory and highly focused on technology, has broadened their point of view. Uh, even the Green New Deal, in the early formulation of it, they were talking about 
just a, it had to be wind, solar, and, and with storage uh, added on. That's what the goal of the 2030 clean uh, electricity would be. They shifted to clean electricity because they were beginning to be hearing the message. They can't count on that uh, uh, working. So uh, these are our big shifts that are occurring. A third uh, big shift, however, kind of goes against this notion of uh, setting it open, and that is that, um, that we should electrify the transportation uh, sector. Obviously, that's become a major uh, thrust in this. And a fourth is that there's a continuing debate, of course, over what the research budget ought to look like, not just to the federal government, but throughout our private, uh, private sector kind of thing. And there are some activists who take the point of view that Frankly, we basically know how to do all this. It's just the political will of adopting what we know with some improvements uh, kind of proposition. And let me just suggest to you, um, and, and then there's the other part of that debate, which is, so if you decide on long-term things, what should that be? And, and, and obviously, we've talked about some of these uh, things, uh, and, and it can range from just renewables and storage all the way over to advanced nuclear fusion, CUS, and even geoengineering. Well, um, going back to Bernie, I don't mean to just pick on him, but I do mean to pick on him. Um, <laughs> and that is that uh, he would allow no money to be spent on uh, CCUS or advanced nuclear, and indeed would try to prevent the continuation of the existing nuclear power fleet in any uh, particular way. It's very clear on the anti-nuclear uh, aspects of this. Well, five, uh, let me mention two others, and then I'll get to, I will close here, I promise. Uh, but is, and the fifth thing is that what is, will not be a surprise to this audience but is really quite a surprise, I think, to even some, a lot of members of Congress. It is that technological developments here are greatly influenced by policy, foreign government policies, and international markets uh, in very significant ways. And that's quite new from 20 to 30 years ago in, in the sort of policy thinking world, uh, uh, certainly in, in Washington, which is, of course, naturally a nationalistic uh, centric. Uh, if you just take solar, as I know you're going to talk about it uh, later, there's no question that from a cost point of view and expansion in the United States, we benefited <laughs> from that perspective uh, in terms of the German policy uh, and, the, uh, and Spain was to a lesser degree, and certainly the Chinese subsidization of the production uh, of panels. All of this brought down uh, this uh, kind of proposition. What we see on the front with electric vehicles is it's not going to be driven just by American policy or American consumers, not by a long shot. It is these number of these other countries, including China, are making commitments to getting to very intense uh, electrification. And Ford Motor Company in America knows and understands that's a, a future part of their, their market. And in China, they just recently announced uh, this year uh, what they call the Green Cooling Action Plan, uh, in which they claim to be using green refrigerants, and they plan to produce 80% of the world's air conditioners. Now, whether they get there or not is uncertain, but we're not, don't just think, oh, we're not getting anywhere because America is not doing it, uh, kind of perhaps we may wish we were doing it here. Uh, and then finally, let me just say uh, on these developments that adaptation is now on the front burner in discussions all across uh, the country. And this is a switch because environmental leaders more than a decade ago were very afraid to talk about adaptation. They thought that would become a political excuse for not mitigating. It's almost becoming the reverse, where he will say, wait a minute, the cost of adaptation, certainly along the coastline, might be really terrific. Maybe we ought to try to see if we can, over time, do something about this. And of course, resiliency is now a wonderful bipartisan uh, proposition. Well, let me just close by a real quick uh, stress on uh, uh, a fervent belief that we need something akin to the moonshot getting to a, having a goal like that, working at it over time, and getting there, <clears throat> and we need climate citizenship. But let's be clear, the climate, the moonshot, is not a model for how we solve this problem. First of all, <clears throat> the goal was very clear. We know we're going to the moon, that's where, what we're doing. Whether that was sensible or not, that's where we're going. And the second of all, it was highly difficult 
technical, engineering, organizational things to be done, but that, that it was extraordinarily accomplished. Here, the goal is hugely diver, diffuse, trying to change across America and elsewhere, transform the energy systems, and transform land management practices. And that's big, difficult, ongoing stuff. And thirdly, citizens, there were thousands of Americans that helped make that moonshot work. But frankly, most of us were just on the sidelines watching and fascinated or criticizing or whatever people were doing. Criticism is a very common response uh, kind of proposition. But if we look at what we're dealing with here, we have the opportunity, we have the necessity for us as individuals to be much more engaged, what we can call uh, climate uh, citizenship. And it doesn't take special technical skills, though some of you have them and can devote them. It doesn't take special financial resources. It simply means you can. There are multiple pathways. Do it as a voter. Do it as a political activist. If that isn't you, don't <laughs> worry about somebody. let somebody else be the political activist. You can do it as a consumer in the things you buy, whether it's cars or meat or whatever it is. And you can do it uh, in terms of pushing producers and conveyors of stuff, as people just really push back on Toyota about the California waiver, um, consumers saying, excuse me, I expect you to do something else uh, as a, a business proposition. And clearly teaching and research and all of these things. And when millions of us act, even in small ways, it will add up and it is also necessary. And thinking about China again, which we often do on these issues, President Xi, just put out what it means to be a good citizen uh, in the uh, Chinese system. One element of that is environmental stewardship uh, kind of proposition. Of course, another element above it is swear fealty to the political party and the government because they know all and they know best and I don't buy that uh, kind of stuff. And they also are developing what they call a social credit system in which they will be able to keep track of your behavior and whether or not you've earned the credits <laughs> to be a good citizen. Uh, they haven't fully developed it. They're trying to roll it out. Now, I'm very much opposed to those kind of approaches uh, to this, but the point goes back to the important role that all of us have here. And it's no time for hand-wringing, it's a time for action. Thank you very much. for being here, Phil. It's such a pleasure to be yeah, up here with you. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I worked and the honor of working for you for seven years in the Congress, and it's just a really an honor to be having this conversation with you. I wanted to take people back. Some of us may remember, but there's a lot of students in the room who may not. So back in the 1970s, we had an energy crisis, actually two energy crises, where we had oil price spikes and gas lines and lots and lots of uh, concern and a, a real national crisis with respect to energy. And in response to that energy crisis, you and your colleagues in Congress under your leadership, I know you're modest, you're gonna wanna right away say all the other people were involved as well. Yes. I, I don't want all the blame. <laughs> so, so you definitely played a leadership in the role, you were definitely in the room where it happened, where you all created the institutions and the laws that are still in place that, that constitute our energy policy infrastructure. And I was just wondering if you could reflect on what lessons you learned and, and what we might be able to glean from that experience that might be relevant to our need now, the imperative now, to address climate change. Well, part of it is, is the focus. Uh, what we were doing was trying to figure out how to transform the energy system with a goal primarily of trying to reduce, if not eliminate, our dependence on the purchase of oil from the Middle East. Uh, and that seemed to be clear as a whole uh, kind of proposition uh, and, and whatnot. So transforming the energy system, the lessons that I got from that is, hey, it's hard, folks. <laughs> and it's hard to know which policies work and which don't and what uh, proposition. So 
difficult to anticipate the future and know it. So all you modelers out there, go to it, try to do it. Just don't fall in love uh, with the uh, conclusions about 2050. They just probably won't pan out the way you hope they do. But that's useful to having us think well about it. So getting a, a picture, a handle on the future is very difficult. The second is that you really have a broad basis of stakeholders that we were engaged with kind of proposition. And guess what? They have different points of view about what the purpose ought to be of the policy, and they have different points of view about what is the technique that ought to be adopted. Some were highly focused on this is about our economy, and therefore we need to have more production of our own domestic resources and other issues around that. But that was one faction. Another faction said, wait a minute, this is all about national security and, and the geopolitical consequences of the Soviet Union possibly having influence over resources that are so important to the West. There was another, a third uh, sort of element of it, uh, which was, no, this is all about equity. We're tired of paying more for gas, or we're tired of, or, or the poor having to pay for energy, period kind of proposition, uh, but it's a, it actually was a lot of middle class complained about equities. The poor didn't speak up as much as they might. Uh, they, had more deserving. they were more deserving, but we, let me tell you, we heard from the middle class uh, kind of proposition. So equity, and then, and then the um, uh, equity of in the economy, security, uh, oh, and environmental. And so this was an opportunity to say, wait a minute, we don't want dirty oil, we don't want dirty this, dirty that, we want to do this, we ought to have, and there was a big fight over conservation versus production. Of course, it was foolish because we needed to do both. But, uh, but the, the point being here, it takes us, so it's going to be a compromise bargaining situation, whether it's in the White House, the Capitol building, across America, that has to get multiple stakeholders involved in this process. Uh, kind of proposition, and it takes time uh, uh, to do this, and that can be very frustrating, but it's hard to stay focused on the goal, it's hard to get everybody on the same page uh, in the room, but it can be done, and leadership matters, and what people do in this room matters as well. Thanks, I guess, do we, do we have time for a couple, one more question <laughs> and then open it up? Just, just let's open it up. Sure. So let's uh, open it up and um, see who has questions for Congressman Schroeder. Yes, go ahead. Where do you see our nuclear energy fitting in all this? Well, my personal view is the risk of climate change are, and getting there are, are very serious and can be done, but we need nuclear as an option. And so I believe both, in, for example, right now, if, if a nuclear power plant that's operating doesn't operate safely, well, then you shut it down. But we should be making sure we don't just allow, for economic reasons, the loss of a major clean energy, uh, a non-polluting CO2 uh, source. Uh, and I know, now I admit I've been involved in lots of nuclear stuff. Uh, and I'll also, as a part of the portfolio, I believe in uh, fusion, uh, which is Quite different, obviously, but uh, uh, also advanced nuclear technologies being developed. Whether we'll get there or not is another issue, and, and there, therefore it's keeping in proportion with what else you're doing, uh, how much focus. But I would not rule them out. I would not rule out any possible options at this point because the uncertainties about technology, the uncertainties about politics, the uncertainties about the economy is what makes me not willing to just follow a modeler who tells me that we got it nailed in 2050. I don't mean to criticize modelers, excuse me. My, my excuse is I can't do that. <laughs> and I can barely understand what you come up with. Jesse. Uh, thanks. Uh, excellent remarks. Oh, thank you. Uh, excellent remarks, and really appreciate your uh, depth of experience in actually getting policy passed. Um, so my question is: We see a lot of enthusiasm on the environmental left right now for big sweeping initiatives that are, I think, as you said, increasingly upping the ante on each other for um, the scale and scope. On the other hand, you know, our system of government is designed to prevent big sweeping change. And it's likely that we'll have you know, challenges, even if there's one party control, the democratic coalition is gonna be diverse itself. So my question is, if we had a narrow window of policy making opportunity in the next Congress, what are the kinds of things that should be focused on that might not in and of themselves solve the climate challenge, but might set up uh, over the next decade, fundamental changes that will make it easier in the future to continue that progress and accelerate it over time? 
very good question. And, but let me, let me uh, I'm going to uh, put myself on the line. You won't remember what I said anyway. So I, <laughs> and you can't vote against me again. So, <laughs> so I, I'm going to go throw the, throw the dice. We can get a carbon tax in the next Congress, folks. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because whatever they do in the next Congress, if the Dem let's assume the Democrats win. If they don't win, I don't know what's going to happen. But, <laughs> but let's, let's assume some version of the Democratic Party wins uh, kind of proposition. All of them are saying they've got to make changes in the tax code. Uh, some uh, elements, some will want to tax the daylights out of you, and some of them are a little wiser in my view. Uh, but um, the, the, uh, the point is, is there, there's going to be a tax bill. But how high a carbon tax? And, well, and then that's the question. And then, but the real question is, the real if issue is here is, we're not going to march into this as, oh, I've got a climate policy for you, folks. Well, let's adopt the climate uh, tax. We're going to march into this. We've got to make some big changes in the tax code. Where do we get some money to plug all the holes that we've created and are going to create in the change? And guess what? We can do a carbon tax uh, with that. And, and of course, the issue then becomes how big, and by the way, that reflects on how much regulation you think you're going to need to go along with that uh, kind of proposition. But, but let me tell you what politically is possible is that I can go home and say, well, I wish I hadn't voted for carbon tax. You know, oh my god. I, uh, but I was able to get you <laughs> in return a cut in your Social Security taxes or I got something reduced. You get what I'm saying? Uh, there you have a trade-off that is politically possible to negotiate. And frankly, the spread of the idea of carbon tax is a lot more under the cover than I think people realize. Even some of the Democratic candidates who certainly don't want to claim, I got it, <laughs> I'm up for it, at this point. Judy, uh, Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, I yeah. Uh, my name is Lars Hedin. I'm on the faculty, and I want to thank you for uh, I want to thank you for a very nice presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, at the end, you started talking about the marketplace. And I want to ask you a little bit, because it seems like that has been missing from the public conversation about this issue. And as a, as a teacher here, as a faculty member here, we see the next generation of students, and, and we can see how their minds are changing in terms of what they expect uh, and the choices they make when it comes to, and, and, and how they incorporate climate change as, a, as an actual cost, as something that makes them decide different things. Um, so I'm wondering, there's an argument a little bit even further than what you, you compared with China and maybe Europe and so on, and there's an, a further argument, and that is the competition in a new marketplace that's, that's created by the new, new generation of, of, uh, of consumers. And I'm wondering, I, I, you see, so rarely see that, but but if you go to Europe or, or, or I go off and, uh, to China, it seems like they understand that the tipping point has come or is just here. And so, 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 so the strength of that argument would be um, competitiveness of, of uh, the private industry in a, in a marketplace. And that would take the instruments away from, uh, from federal or state in position, right, to into the marketplace itself. So I'm wondering, why don't we hear more conversation about that? Can you reflect on that, please? Well, I, well, I think we should hear more conversation, and you do in many circles. When you're talking about the national politicians out of the campaign stuff, they're talking about national policy. The wise ones are talking about policies that help stimulate competition uh, in directed in that goal. Let me, let me suggest to you, you can argue competitions both ways. The competition without some direction on carbon and environmental well, it can actually uh, go the opposite direction it did for many, many years, although recently we benefited from the cheap natural gas uh, pushing uh, coal out of the marketplace, and that's been our winner in terms of uh, real improvements here. But uh, the, I, again, it's a problem trying in the political economy to get a balance and an understanding of both. And I don't think there's any magic to that. I certainly resist my colleagues on the left who think we invented it at the Department of Energy and we, uh, we did this. No, the Department of Energy has helped finance and support private sector activity here at this university and elsewhere uh, that is really important. Uh, and I think, especially this is a time when social media is and can be turned to <laughs> trying to 
push uh, people in the private marketplace to be competitive just as they can try to push the politicians to uh, get that. So it is hard to understand our system. But in my view, there are three virtues to the American landscape. One is that actually we don't allow the concentration of political power in this centralized authoritarian way. And I have to admit, I'm often frustrated by the fact that, well, if my own state wouldn't do anything, but California would. But, and the second is that we have this very dynamic economy, which can be very negative in some aspects, but in fact, what it does is it can generate capital, it can shift it quickly to something, and it, it will help. And if you innovate, whether it's in the private sector or at the university, you're likely to see a payoff, either in status or economics or just in self-worth uh, kind of proposition. And the third is our civil society. I mean, it's slight contrast to China. China wants to control its civil society. We thought they were opening up uh, as they opened up the economy, but now they want to politically control it just like this old Soviets tried and whatnot. And we have a very dynamic in which you can make choices and, and you can do that. Now, that has often worked against <laughs> sometimes good policy, but the reality is that when we get these things mobilized in a certain direction, I'm counting on the dynamism uh, that is going to carry us forward. That's why I don't worry too much about what the plan says about 2050. I worry about getting the dynamics in the direction of the society, and you and your students can make a difference on that. Hi, uh, Peter Starring from uh, UK. Uh, so I hear a lot about 2050 being the scenario target, and yeah, in the UK we have net zero by 2050, uh, and it's been likened, the policies have been likened to harnessing the power of unicorns. Uh, and the question is how IPCC uh, have set 2030 really as the deadline before catastrophic change is irreversible. If you're setting scenarios at 2050 or even 2030, who becomes accountable for those? Well, the trouble is the system of accountability isn't very clear, especially over generations. Uh, we, we can blame ourselves, our neighbors, our children, our parents, uh, uh, everybody and their son, and we're all pretty good at that uh, kind of proposition. So there, you, we have to collectively try to hold ourselves and other people accountable. And one piece of policy is what we call the nudge policy. These are a different set of characteristics where, whether it's the federal government, state government, or something, reminds you that your neighbor is actually saving on energy and it doesn't say this, but it says, how foolish are you? <laughs> or are you keeping up with your neighbor? Uh, and you know, there's multiple ways in industry and, and other things. This, these are weak policies, in my view, but they are useful to getting behavior. So I don't think there is an answer to that. And part of that is, that's almost like saying, logically, we ought to be able to figure this out. And I ask you as academics, and think, go for it. But don't expect human behavior is very dynamic. We do have, I believe, individual will. <laughs> and it shows up in economics. It shows up in politics. And, and I would just, and I have a whole speech on this. That if you start at 20, uh, 2,000 years, and you've got people in this audience that are in energy, and you've got the Department of Energy, and you've got Exxon, and you've got all these people, and you ask them to project what was going to happen over that first decade of this century, that consensus would have been very strong, but they would have missed pricing, they would, what was going to happen to oil and gas prices, they would have missed what was happening technologically, they would have even missed where the political parties were going to be. They were changing their opinions kind of proposition. So I, I'm much more open-minded on this and the desire for action and dynamism. <laughs> That's a good, a good example of it. Great. Uh, my name is Richard Moss, and I'm following Judy's uh, footsteps as a fellow here this year, as a visiting fellow. I'm a refugee from a Department of Energy laboratory. Ah. Um, and I was really glad to hear you mention resilience. Um, I think resilience adds an incredible amount of complexity to the issue in two ways. First, we have to choose mitigation options that themselves are going to be resilient, which doesn't make the problem easier. And second, we're going to need a heck of a lot of adaptation. And it's a part of the problem we don't often talk about. Um, you know, and it's so pervasive, it's things like in the, the FEMA, you know, and HUD, they provide disaster recovery funding. A lot of it is spent after, say, a hurricane in the coasts, 
to put people back in places where they shouldn't be anymore. How are we going to see the federal government start to incorporate adaptation as an objective that really helps us make a more resilient society? Well, I don't follow it closely, but my impression is if you went to the appropriations bills that are just piled up and put out, you'll find any number of provisions designed to try to push agencies to, to focus on that. And I, going back to the question of what Congress could bite off, Congress is going to bite off a lot of this in terms of small pieces. And so what you're going to see is on authorizations, on appropriations, you're going to see challenges to do this Astro Assistance Program, challenges to FEMA's uh, approach to this, challenges to you know how what we subsidize and uh, uh, kind of thing. And uh, again, uh, one can bite off as an academic or as a student or an activist organization some piece of that and go after it uh, full bore, and that will be a useful uh, contribution. Uh, kind of proposition, but I think that the reality is everything. Now you can almost turn on the, the weather or anything else, and everything is described as warming the earth. And not quite accurate, but but the point is that that this is getting so pervasive, just in general thought, that I think it creates the the, the issue of denial and all that is so passe at this point. Uh, kind of proposition. But, but what you illustrate is this issue is going to be with us for the next 30 years. There's no question about it, whether, on, whether it's an adaptation or a mitigation. And we're going to be making policy over and over. Well, let, me, let me just quickly say, Judy represents somebody who came out of an engineering background, right? Uh, and she came to the political world of Capitol Hill. And uh, my impression is, without having discussed it with her, it was a big eye-opener to her. <laughs> I think she, on the one hand, was, hmm, <laughs> saying, what are these people all about? And on the other hand, I think she began to appreciate the complications of human beings, whether it's in families, churches, or, or politics, actually making something happen. Uh, but she made a huge contribution as she learned and, and was able to bring both her technical knowledge that she had a major impact on the, uh, the uh, allocation system uh, under the Clean Air Act for the uh, acid rain, uh, where we had the, the cap and trade system uh, developed. Because she, while we were negotiating, she said, well, maybe somebody ought to keep track of what they, all these people claim they won out of the deal. And she was tracking it on the computer, and she comes in at 2 a.m. and this negotiation says, Bill, the other side has so promised everybody they're way over the cap <laughs> kind of proposition. And we won, <laughs> because she did the intellectual work in a day that helped make the politics possible. So thank you. And she's that person. Do we, are we, are we getting, can we have one more? Or can I, oh, we have two more. What, what do you think? And I also have Something one. Bear. So. All right, we're going to go a couple minutes over, but we'll try to keep it. I can, yeah. Yes, go ahead. So I'm going to try to keep this as a question rather than a small rant, but I think one issue is that a lot of people, you know, say we need to stop climate change. Like I have a friend who's vegan for environmental reasons, but then he accepted a job recently where he has to take like a six-hour flight every week for the next 12 weeks. Or I have a, you know, another family friend or an uncle who you know, also cares about the He's getting an electric stove now, yet he also, once again, takes flights across the country many times per year. And it seems almost like we need to give people more information. Like when you buy something at the store, you look, might look at the calorie count if you're trying to lose weight, and you similarly have like a carbon count on that. Just because people seem to talk a lot or say, we backed out the climate accord, but you, know, you individually can still do whatever you want to cut back on your emissions. So it seems almost like there's a lack of information to the public rather than just policy and people are kind of pushing onto the government. And it's very easy when nothing's happening because you don't have to actually suffer or do anything. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is on trying to keep people accountable, give them more information and... That's a very important thing and that's part of the function of a university uh, kind of proposition uh, to help spread the knowledge. But more and more, private organizations and efforts are doing that. I'm chairman of the board of a small environmental group that tries to get religious organizations, tries to get professional societies like the pediatricians and others 
to commit to trying to get their members to understand uh, what they can do in a language that is theirs, not the environmental movement or left leaders or whatever, uh, but to try to understand uh, what, why this is a challenge and then what they, as in their profession or their one their own footprint, but also to see if they can help the country find a blueprint uh, uh, for this. And so you can help take up the cause of with you know telling a member of the family who wants to squander everything, but of course they will naturally call you a hypocrite when you decide to get on that airplane. But let me suggest to you, <laughs> but let me suggest to you that I I discovered early uh, in the small town in Indiana that I wasn't going to be a perfect human being, and none of us are going to be. So the goal here is to try to get us to change what we can and willing to change over time. <clears throat> and it will make a difference. But it'll always be easy to point out who's not doing their, their part of their job. I, I would rather get focused on helping people think of a positive way to be a part of this solution. Yeah. So can, can, you, can we have one closing question? To, to uh, no, I think we're going to No, we got to go. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. Let's, uh, right. I let's, was going to give him an opportunity to close. No, no, no. no. You're good. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's thank uh, Judy Greenwald and, of course, Phil Sharp. Thank you.